India. We go on safaris and they're right next to our trucks, open trucks. Now I feel really stupid if, if they're really wanting to hunt us. Well, most of us aren't infected with toxoplasmosis, but a lot of us are infected with toxoplasmosis and the vast majority of motorcycle victims are infected with toxoplasmosis. In fact, and why? Because they're risk takers. And that's what toxoplasmosis has done. Hello, hello, Heal Squad. Welcome back. Glad to be back with you as well. Hope you're wonderful wherever you are in this crazy, beautiful world. We have a great episode for you guys today. I'm so excited. I had uh, a really nice, nerdy conversation with Dr. Stephen Gundry that is not my first. We've had him here before, but we'll get to that in a second. Let's start with our quote of the day. Your present circumstances don't determine where you can go. They merely determine where you start. That is from Nido Cubin. I hope I said that right. Your present circumstances don't determine where you can go. They merely determine where you start. I love that. Friends, we have a long way to go when we are uh, thinking about the gut microbiome. We're starting to learn about it. We're hearing things. Today, hopefully, we'll learn some more things that we can uh, add to our knowledge base and, and make better choices thereafter. Uh, really, really excited. I took so many notes for myself that um, that I'm going to apply as well. But um, we broke it up into two parts for you because it was a long conversation. And I like to make these very digestible for you guys. So in part one, uh, we're going to talk about medical school. There's a big mic drop about medical school and what they are not teaching. Hint, hint, gut microbiome. I can't even talk, gut microbiome, forgive me, uh, and how behind medical school teachings are at this point. You're going to be fascinated to hear this. We're going to talk about reversing autoimmune diseases um, and risk takers. Listen up. You might be taking risks because your bacteria is manipulating you. I know that sounds really crazy, but you're going to have to hang in. Dr. Stephen Gundry is our guest today who's sharing all of that. He is one of the world's top cardiothoracic surgeons. He's a pioneer in nutrition. He hosts the top-rated health show, the Dr. Gundry Podcast. He's the founder and director of the International Heart and Lung Institute Center for Restorative Medicine. And he's the founder of Gundry MD, a line of wellness products and supplements. So he had a very distinguished surgical career, as you'll hear, as a professor and chairman at Loma Linda University. And he decided to change his focus to curing modern diseases via dietary changes because lo and behold, it can happen. Thank you, Hippocrates, for teaching us, let food be thy medicine. Someone is actually doing it. He's the author of New York Times bestsellers, The Plant Paradox, The Plant Paradox Cookbook, The Plant Paradox Quick and Easy, and The Longevity Paradox. And he released his latest book that we are focusing on today called Gut Check, Unleash the Power of Your Microbiome to Reverse Disease and Transform Your Mental, Physical, and Emotional Health. And we are so excited to have him here today, as I said, this is part one, so don't forget, there's going to be a part two tomorrow. But for now, enjoy this part. So <laughs> Dr. Gundry, it's been a minute since Plant Paradox. I think you said seven years? Seven years in April. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So your latest work, Gut Check, which I have right here, delves into the concept that all diseases begin in the gut. And I feel like we've heard a lot about this in recent years. Uh, you're basically expanding on Hippocrates' thesis that all diseases begin in the gut. I feel like we're finally going back to what people have said <laughs> back, 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 back when we were brighter. What made you want to delve into the gut? Well, um, as I explained, I guess, in the plant paradox about 25 odd years ago, more than that, actually, uh, almost 30. Uh, I, my life changed when I met a guy who I call Big Ed in all my books. He's a real person from Miami, Florida, who was 48 years old when I met him. Uh, I was chief 
uh, professor and head of cardiothoracic surgery at Loma Linda University here in Southern California. And I was a famous heart surgeon. And one of my areas of fame was operating on people who nobody else wanted to operate on. And there were a number of us and still are. And Big Ed had inoperable coronary artery disease. That means you couldn't put, he had so much crud in all of his blood vessels that you couldn't put stents in. You couldn't bypass because there wasn't any place to land bypasses. And he would go to various centers with this diagnosis, looking for an idiot surgeon like myself to take him on. Hmm. And he spent six months doing this and every place he went, and I could name the centers, but they, they turned him down. And so after about six months, he arrived in my office at Loma Linda, carrying his angiogram, the movie of his blood vessels from Miami six months earlier. And I looked at it and I said, you know, you got to agree with everybody else. I, I hate to turn you down, but I agree. There's nothing we can do for you. And he said, well, yeah, but. I've been on a diet for the last six months and I've lost 45 pounds. Well, the reason he's called Big Ed is he weighed 265 pounds when I met him. Uh, so he had literally been over 300 pounds. And he says, and I've been to a health food store and I've been taking a lot of supplements. And he actually brought in a large bag of supplements. He says, you know, maybe I did something in here. and. You know, I'm scratching my professor beard and going, well, good for you, uh, but that's, that's not going to do anything in here. And I know what you did with all those supplements. You made expensive urine, which I firmly <laughs> believe back then. He says, well, you know, I've come all the way. What would it hurt to get another angiogram, another coronary cath cardiac catheterization? I said, ah. okay. So we get a new cardiac catheterization the next day. And in six months' time, this guy has cleaned out 50% of the blockages in his heart. Gone. And obviously, I'd never seen anything like that and believed it was impossible that there I am staring at the two films. So I say, you know, tell me about this diet of yours. This, you know, I'm intrigued. So he starts rattling off what he's been eating and just with serendipity, back in the dark ages, I went to Yale as an undergraduate. And in those days, we could design our own major. And it was basically a kind of a master's program where you had a thesis and you had to defend a thesis and blah, blah, blah. So my thesis was you could take a grade A, manipulate its food supply, manipulate its environment, and prove you'd arrive at a human being. And prove what yeah. in the human being? Prove that you could convert a great ape to a human being oh, by, got it. by manipulating its food supply hmm. and manipulating its environment. And I actually defended my thesis and I got an honors and uh, I gave it to my parents and went off to become a famous art surgeon. So as Big Ed is telling me what he's eating, I go, wait a minute, that, that's my crazy thesis at Yale. Yeah, I forgot seriously. that part of the story. Yeah. Wow. And that was my thesis at Yale. In fact, it's, it's up there in the bookcase. Anyhow, so I said, let me see those supplements. And I was famous for inventing a catheter that is still used uh, to protect the heart during heart surgery or for transplants. And in the solution that we put in the, in the heart blood vessels, uh, I had a lot of interesting miracle ingredients. And lo and behold, a lot of those miracle ingredients Big Ed was swallowing as supplements. And it never occurred to me that I should swallow them. And why it's so poignant is that even though I was a famous heart surgeon I was, and I was running 30 miles a week, going to the gym one hour a day, eating a healthy, low-fat, mostly vegetarian diet, I was 70 pounds overweight. I was doing baby heart transplants with migraine headaches. Don't recommend it. Uh, I had high cholesterol, pre-diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, arthritis so bad in my knees, I had to wear braces to run, so on and so forth. And I was told it was genetic because my father was the same way, and too bad. 
So anyhow, um, I started experimenting on myself after meeting Big Ed, and I lost 50 pounds my first year and another 20 subsequently. And I started taking a bunch of supplements. And lo and behold, all of these problems that I had went away. So I started working on the people that I had operated on at Loma Linda. And after I operated on them, I'd say, here, I want you to eat certain foods and I don't want you to eat other foods. And I want you to go to Costco or Trader Joe's because there was no Amazon back then. And I want you to buy some supplements and, you know, I'm going to see how you, what, what happens because I want to keep you away from me in the future. And amazingly enough, after about a year of this, it was working so well that on a Friday morning, I was looking in the mirror before going to work. And I said, you know, I've got this all wrong. I shouldn't operate on people and then teach me how to avoid me in the future. I should teach them how to eat so I never have to operate on them. Now, you know, that's a really stupid idea if you think about it. Um, <clears throat> Doesn't help your uh, your wallet, that's for sure. No. Um, <laughs> or pay wife, back your medical bills, your school bills. Uh, my, my wife reminded me of that, of that many, many times through the years. <laughs> Anyhow. So at the height of my career, um, I resigned my position at, at La Melinda, and I moved down the road to Palm Springs and set up a clinic. And because I was a researcher, I said, hey, look, I want you to eat certain foods. Don't eat these. I want you to take some supplements. And every three months, we're going to get blood work on you. And insurance will pay for it. And we'll see what happens. And I guess the rest is history. The Gundry guinea pigs. So what happened yeah. to them? They all, they all did well, I imagine. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, so I wrote my first book back in 2007, which was called Dr. Gundry's Diet Evolution. And in it, I mentioned a couple of people who had autoimmune diseases that reversed with this program. And subsequent to that book, people started showing up in my office and say, what do you know about autoimmune disease? I said, I don't know anything about autoimmune disease. But I'm a transplant immunologist. That's what all my lab research was about. I know how the immune system works. I know how to fool the immune system. And if you want to play, let's play. So that's uh, now 80% of my practice is autoimmune disease, where people come to me who've been everywhere around and with no results. And knock on wood, we can take anyone with an autoimmune disease immune disease, and in nine months to a year, 94% of them are in remission on no medication. Yeah. That's, that's not bad. It's um, amazing. It's amazing. I've reversed my ANA. Um, I know the Hashimoto's, once I test again, is going to be gone. Um, I've been doing my own like protocol with my naturopath and just kind of getting the sun and doing things like that. But what I think is fascinating, and I'd love for you to share with the Heal Squad, the differences now in your perspective as a doctor, as a medical doctor who went to school, who learned a certain way. I mean, I even highlighted page two in your book where you talked about when you were in medical school back in the Stone Age, you were taught that the human gut was basically a hollow tube. Food went in, <laughs> digestion occurred, protein, sugars, and fats were absorbed, and whatever waste was left came out in feces. Now we all know the gut microbiome is much more deeper than that. We're gonna get into that. But when you look at your training and you look at kind of the state of affairs, we're sicker than we ever have. How do you how do you handle explaining that to the every person out there who's going to a traditional doctor and not getting the results? Um, well, long ago, I was a part of a a national organization called the Institute for Health Healthcare Improvement that came out of Boston. And research has shown in any field that the practicing physician is 20 years behind current knowledge. Wow. And, and it's not their fault, but that's, you, you name, you, you name the, you know, field. And most practicing physicians are 20 years behind uh, current knowledge. And so I 
I approached that with that idea that, hey, um, I, we all need to catch up. Now, if you had asked me 20 years ago, when I was kind of first starting this, asked me about leaky gut, I probably would have told you it was pseudoscience. But, <coughs> excuse me, thanks to work by Alessio Fasano, who's a pediatric gastroenterologist who's now at Harvard, uh, he and others showed and proved that leaky gut exists, intestinal permeability. He showed the mechanisms, how gluten, which happens to be a lectin, and we can get into that, uh, causes leaky gut. And I've shown that it can be measured. And I've shown and published that we can follow the progression of that healing. And we can show that every human being with an autoimmune disease has leaky gut, period. And th that autoimmune disease will resolve as the leaky gut is resolved. Even and celiac? Yeah, so celiac is the extreme form of gluten intolerance. But what people don't know that I tried to point out in the plant paradox is you can take people with celiac disease and the traditional, the gold standard of diagnosing celiac is an intestinal biopsy. Uh, we do have blood tests for it now, but the gold standard is intestinal biopsy. So they a published paper a few years ago looked at people with biopsy-proven celiac disease, put on a gluten-free diet for a year and a half, then rebiopsied, and 70% of them on a gluten-free diet still had celiac disease by intestinal biopsy. Why? Because most people on a gluten-free diet are eating other lectins that are just as mischievous. And when we remove those common irritants, then and only then does the problem resolve. And it resolves to what degree? Like if someone listening with celiac right now is like, wait, so does that mean I'll be able to eat bread again? So that's a great question. Uh, one of the things we, I think we have to realize, and probably Hippocrates knew this, not in the way we think of it now, but normally we have, we would have had a very, very di diverse, vigorous microbiome that was really the first line of defense against any possible foods or anything else that we swallow. And for instance, there are bacteria that love to eat gluten think it's delicious and detoxify it. There are bacteria that love to eat oxalates and people who think they're sensitive to oxalates, they don't have those bacteria. Uh, I have a lot of people who are oxalate sensitive. Once we fix their gut, miracle, miracle, they can eat all the oxalates that they want. But with our gut, our, I, since it was Super Bowl fairly recently, so our gut, bacteria were the offensive front four of a, of a football team and we were the quarterback that they were protecting and unfortunately uh, through everything i've written about and other people have written about our front four has been decimated and we're not only got third string players in we're pulling folks out of the stands to protect <laughs> the quarterback and you know the quarterback's getting sacked and we're getting sacked so the point of all this is if, and it's a big if, you rebuild the gut, increase its diversity, repopulate the gut, give these guys what they want to eat, which is our other problem, then I think we can be protected from all these things. Do I have celiacs that can eat wheat in Europe? Yes, I do. Do I have celiacs that can eat wheat in America? No, I don't. And we can get into that. <laughs> wow. Well, that's hopeful for yeah. sure. Um, you know, I want to first ask you a few things about the beginning of the book, because you go into this whole story about toxoplasma and cats and 
I found it really fascinating. And I wonder if you can quickly give people the rundown on it. Because I, I was left with a few questions like, you know, if the rats, well, I'll let you explain it first and then I'll ask my questions after so I don't overly confuse everyone who's listening. But this is a really fascinating story. Um, and and you, you wrote about it in the beginning for a reason, so. Yeah, you know, we, we don't give enough credit probably because we don't know that single cell organisms uh, are actually sentient beings. Um, single cell bacteria, single cell protozoans like toxoplasmosis uh, have a plan. And, and what are these single cells? Like, I, I still am like, okay, what's a single cell? It's like just one single cell in my body? Yeah. Just any uh, single cell. Just, just as a fascinating aside, since they're this came all up sentient the, beings. I mean, talk about woo woo. So I was a transplant surgeon, um, and we knew that many of our transplanted people who got a heart from somebody else uh, began to have, among other things, interesting cravings that someone who never ate a McDonald's hamburger in their life uh, would suddenly develop cravings for McDonald's hamburgers. And when they would talk to the donor's family, and these unfortunately were usually young people who were killed in an auto accident or a motor motorcycle accident, and they would, when this one just comes to mind, had a hank always loved mcdonald's hamburgers and it and you go what wait a minute that's kind of voodoo well there's an article uh, this weekend all about this woman who got a heart transplant who began having very vivid dreams about uh, being in an auto accident and being crushed in her chest and she thought, well, maybe it's because I have an incision in my chest and blah, blah, blah. And they finally hooked her up with the donor. And it was a young teenager who was killed in a car accident. And his chest was crushed. Oh, my God. And, yeah. And she's going, holy cow, I'm living that experience. Wow. And so we now know, to, this gets to your point, we know there are what are called dendritic cells that are single cell neurons that carry information they have a memory and a lot of my work as a xenotransplant surgeon and researcher was when we wanted to train the animal to accept a foreign animal we would actually grind up pieces of spleen and liver and bone marrow and inject it into the animal when we did the heart transplant and we could use these cells to educate the immune system of, of the animal to accept a completely foreign animal, like a we, pig to a baboon. Dr. Gundry, I'm gonna pause you right there because we can't go forward without thanking the incredible supporters of our show. Just like we need our good bacteria in our guts, we need our good supporters to supporters. keep the lights on here. So spring is coming up, friends, and I am very excited and I'm anticipating it um, and went shopping for it at Macy's. I picked out some really great pieces for uh, the new season with their style crew. One of the best things that Macy's offers that I love and I love sharing with you guys all the time is that they have a personal styling service that is free that will help you find the perfect additions for your closet. If you want to add a few things for the spring, you've got a fun event. I have Athena's christening coming up. I have so many spring events that I'm getting ahead of. And then of course, just spring fashion in general. So if you wanna elevate your look or you need some inspiration or you need some assistance, maybe you've lost a few pounds and you want some help so that you can celebrate your weight loss or whatever it is, head over to macy's.com forward slash heel squad. I have some of my favorite finds there and it could be for you, it could be for your husband, it could be for uh, a gift. I've got everything there for you. And when it comes to transforming your hair into something truly amazing, there's one brand that I am obsessed with and that is Way, O-U-A-I. 
Uh, I hope I'm having an amazing hair day today, Dr. Gundry. I don't know if you noticed. Um, I used no, to be. No way. Yes, no way. Yes way. <laughs> um, I used yes the way. hair oil today on my ends to get my uh, dry ends to look really amazing. They have so many incredible products that I love, whether it's their leave-in conditioner or their hair oil, like I mentioned. I always know I'm having a good day when I use these products because my hair looks great and it makes me feel great. And I love their commitment to creating products that deliver salon-worthy results without the hassle. And it's good for your hair, so I love it. They're my staples, they're my everyday routine. I don't travel without them. Kevin was the first. I bought them for him, he loved them. So Dr. Gundry, you might actually love it too. Because, oh wow, I'm ready. Well, cause Kevin wanted um, some kind of conditioner he could leave in his hair cause it would get a little dry, put some products in there, you know. And so I found this little leave-in conditioner at Sephora by way. I gave it to him and then I started seeing it and I was like, oh, let me try it. And then of course I started to love it and then had to buy my own. So for any listeners who are eager to try Way O-U-A-I, you can head over to www.thewayouai.com. Use the promo code Heal Squad. You'll get 15% off. So, Dr. Gundry, uh, if you want to try a little leave in conditioner, you can get 15% off. All right, I'm ready. <laughs> All right, back to the gut. Wait, so if I'm eating a burger today, whatever that cow went through, I might be feeling? You might be. Now, Stop I know it that right just... now. Are you serious? It... This is so woo-woo. Oh, my but, God. No, we're bypassing one thing, <laughs> which is the good news. Probably the, the digestion stops that from happening. Okay. <laughs> okay. But if you inject it, uh, then you bypass that system. All right. Back to toxoplasmosis. <laughs> toxoplasmosis bananas. is a single cell organism. One single cell. It's a parasite. Like many parasites, many parasites have a two-phase life cycle in that they have to get into an intermediate host to get to where they finally want to be. Mm -hmm. And in terms of toxoplasmosis, toxoplasmosis wants to get into a cat. That's its objective. To get into a cat, toxoplasmosis has decided that a rat is the best way to get into a cat. Now you go, well, that's a stupid idea. Cats, you know, rats are afraid of cats. They run from cats. In fact, they run from the smell of cat litter. So what a dumb idea. Well, not so fast. So toxoplasmosis gets into a rat and other animals that we'll get to in a second by drinking water that's been infected with cat poop. So the toxoplasmosis goes to the brain of the animal who just drank it, if you will, and it literally rewires the dopaminergic centers of the brain to make the rat, number one, think cat urine is the most sexy thing it's ever smelled. And if it sees a cat, it is excited, literally sexually excited, and runs towards the cat, runs towards the danger. And of course, uh, what a great way to get an animal that's definitely afraid of a cat to run towards its biggest fear. And that's how it gets into the cat. Now, what's fascinating about this is there are other animals that toxoplasmosis manipulates to get into a cat. A recent example is wolves in Yellowstone Park. Now, wolves who are infected with toxoplasmosis are vastly more likely to become pack leaders than wolves who are not infected with toxoplasmosis. Why? Because they are risk takers. They are bold. And so why would toxoplasmosis bother with a wolf? Well, it turns out, even though the wolf is an upper level predator, its main predator is a mountain lion and a cat. Now we know that in Africa, one of 
the favorite foods of tigers in the jungle are chimpanzees. And lo and behold, chimpanzees are a favorite target to be infected with toxoplasmosis so that they will head towards danger. And humans are a favorite target of toxoplasmosis because big cats love to eat humans. In fact, it's one of the largest causes of death from tigers in India. Eating that's so funny. Humans. I didn't know that. I thought yeah. sharks, yes, but... <laughs> yeah, no, that's in India. In India. We go on safaris and they're right next to our trucks. Open trucks. Now I feel really stupid if, if they're really wanting to hunt us. Well, it, most of us aren't infected with toxoplasmosis, but a lot of us are infected with toxoplasmosis and the vast majority of motorcycle victims are infected with toxoplasmosis. In fact, and why? Because they're risk takers. And that's what toxoplasmosis has done. So are risk takers, would you bet that anyone who's a risk taker is infected with toxoplasmosis? It's very common. In fact, I don't mean to uh, say this and imply anything by it, but there's some evidence that people who do heroic things out of the ordinary heroic things are often infected with toxoplasmosis because they would take chances that seem crazy, but that's what toxoplasmosis allows you to do. So how do we as humans get this? Because I know in the book you talk about how they tell pregnant women not to go near cat litter boxes, but you can still have a cat. Can't the cat transfer it to you or does it only go through the urine? So one thing is it has to be an outdoor cat. The cat can't pick it up unless it's outdoors actually eating a rat that's been infected. Okay. So if you have an indoor cat, which, but just to be safe, you know, it's the common wisdom is if you're pregnant, scoop the poop. So have your husband or significant other scoop the poop because you acquire it, you know, from, from the feces. Uh, and, and when I first posted this, you know, people say, Dr. Gundry, you're fear mongering about cats. I had a cat in medical school. My mother had a cat. Said, Come on, folks. Um, I'm not. I like cats. Well, I would be worried now if they just pooped and their butt's dirty and now it's on top of me and, you know. Well, but you're not, you're really not going to be affected by it. Um, and if having um, less fear of things, it might actually be a good thing. Well, I would love some toxoplast me. I think it would be great for me because all I have is fear. But how does that affect the gut? Well, it doesn't per se, but what we're now realizing is what we've known about what toxoplasmosis could do, we now say, well, wait a minute, this is a single cell organism and look at the effect it has in manipulating human behavior. So let's go back now and look at the gut microbiome and are there bacteria that are capable of manipulating human behavior? And so part of gut check is, lo and behold, holy cow, absolutely. I think one of the best examples, which to me is very exciting, is most antidepressants are what are called SSRIs, the serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And most people know or are told that it's going to take about a month for these things to kick in. And recent evidence shows that SSRIs change the gut microbiome to produce compounds like serotonin, like 5-HTP, like even dopamine, that are actually the source of how these things affect the brain. If you think about it, a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, if it's really doing that, then you swallow it tomorrow, your it depression should, should go away, right? It should work because that's happening in the brain. Nope, it takes a month because it's taken that long to change the microbiome. To manipulate. To, it, to manipulate it, to make, to get those bugs to produce the compound. 
So with every little thing that we're now uncovering about these, this microbiome, we're learning that almost everything Hippocrates predicted is, is right, that all disease begins in the gut. And to me, that's what's so fascinating. I'll give you another example. Uh, I've become good friends through the years with uh, Dr. Dale Bredesen, who wrote The End of Alzheimer's, uh, with Dr. David Perlmutter, um, another great neurologist. And we laugh because, you know, here I am, a cardiologist and heart surgeon, and here they are, neurologists. And all we talk about is the gut and the microbiome. And it's like, you know, how could we have been so stupid to, to not realize that everything all of us are interested in it was coming from the gut? You know, what a dumb thing. So do they teach that in medical school now to students? Here's the bad news. I was, <laughs> I was recently um, uh, doing a podcast with uh, another good friend of mine, Dr. Mark Hyman, and he's got a daughter who's a third year medical student. I will not tell you the august institution where she's going. Uh, but he asked her recently, he says, so, you know, what have you, what courses have you had on the microbiome? And she said, not a thing, not a thing. And it's like, what? <laughs> well, because, you know, most of the medical school curriculum is controlled by pharmaceutical companies. Thank you. Go ahead. It Keep is. Going. <laughs> Sorry about that. I mean, there's no funding for anything else. Um, you know, I had the pleasure of, of being a clinical associate at the NIH uh, long ago. And back in the good old days, the NIH did most of the funding for research at most of the universities. That's what you competed for, for funds. Now the NIH budget is minuscule. And so these universities have to do research. And so almost all the funding for the medical schools come out of pharm pharmaceuticals. So they don't really want us to know that the gut microbiome Bingo. is that important because then that really eradicates a lot of their pharmaceuticals. True. I they mean, don't want to know that you can get dopamine from the sun. So let's make sure everyone keeps wearing you know, sunscreen and sunscreen. all of that. And let's not talk about sunscreen because that'll, that'll cause controversy. I know. I know. I've been getting it. <laughs> so I think it's it's always... I have worn, I have worn sunscreen in 15 years. Really? And you have like really? the more lighter skin, yeah. right? What do they call it on the scale? More sun know. sensitive, I guess. <clears throat> but I, I, I eat my sunscreen. Yeah. In fact, there's a, you know, this is a little off the subject, but since it's... See, I'm, I'm moving this for a second because there's a book it's sitting on. So I only bring this up. Now, so there's a very infamous professor at Boston University by the name of Michael Hollick. The vitamin the D solution. Up, yeah, the vitamin D solution. And to give you the power of um, belief systems, let's put it that way. So Dr. Hollick is a dermatologist, and he actually wrote quite a number of years ago that people should get sun exposure, and they basically should not use sunscreen, that vitamin D was that important. So he went against his training, profession and training as well. He was a tenured professor. He was fired. He, first From Boston all, University? He, yeah. He was fired for this heresy and you cannot chance. fire a tenured professor unless I mean, basically for a me too issue but you cannot fire a tenured professor that's the benefit of having tenure and you know, earn tenure because you're valuable so he was fired and he spent 10 years in the courts and finally uh, got reinstated but he was fired for heresy and it's like oh my gosh you know how and how how do you combat this and you know to his credit you know he just kept going at it and that's amazing. of course the evidence is 
that sunscreens have been disastrous. If for no other reason, they're loaded with endocrine disruptors. And why we would want to smear endocrine disruptors on our skin or our kids is just, just horrible. So. This is so refreshing and so exciting because you are a respected doctor and it's so hard, I know, for all of us to wrap our heads around new information and information that is not as mainstream and as popular as what we've been uh, taught to this uh -huh. date. And so I, I did a whole show recently where I talked about, you know, what I've always talked about is you have to be the CEO of your health. I'm going to bring in different experts. I'm going to bring in different ideologies, different thoughts, different, you know, modalities. But you have to do what you're comfortable with. I can't tell you go sit in the sun and you're going to heal like I did, because if you're scared of it, there's going to be some issues potentially along the way. You have to do what you feel safe with. You have to do your own research, be exposed to things and do your own research. But I had incredible healing and incredible turnaround results in two and a half weeks of being in the sun. Yeah. That's it. Like it's, 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 it's so important. Um, but it's, it's always refreshing to hear that there are people who are, moving the chains forward on on progress because as you mentioned earlier and i asked for a reason i knew what the answer was going to be to are they teaching gut microbiome in the in the medical schools right now i know that they're funded by pharmaceutical companies i know they have no incentive to teach doctors anything about that or young you know, young medical students um they're taught symptoms prescription that's it and Hospitals top two goals from what I've been told from top doctors make money don't get sued that was that was from a very successful doctor who owns thousands of clinics and hospitals and so it's it's like we have to it feels like such a big thing that's never going to get fixed I had someone pull me aside and said Maria you really should be careful because this is too big for you to be to be pushing these ideas and these concepts, um, and it is scary. I'm sure you've had many scares along the way in your journey. People probably want to sue you and take your medical license and do all kinds of things. I'm sure, right? Nah, they just call me a quack. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's um, for some obscure reason. A few weeks ago, I was watching for no good reason. Uh, Moneyball. Uh, the Moneyball uh, was about the o Oakland Athletics baseball team um, that brought in a, a couple of guys who wanted to use kind of in the early days computer rankings to figure out who was going to be good and who wasn't in terms of ball players. And long story short, they were had the least expensive roster in baseball, and they went on to win 21 games in a row and. The long of the short of it was that the Boston Red Sox wanted to hire the guy who figured this out and as their general manager. And so he went and interviewed with the Boston Red Sox and he says, nah, you don't want me. He says, everybody hates me. And one of the lines from the general manager was, uh, and the owner of the Boston Red Sox, he says, you know, those who go through the wall first always get bloody mm. and i thought it was i thought it was very well described yeah you that know makes me uh, emotional so somebody uh, there's a very famous uh, physician who really discovered that uh, women giving childbirth uh, even as late as the 17 1800s uh many of them died following childbirth from infection uh from childbirth and there was a physician by the name of Samuel Weiss who said, you know something? I'm pretty convinced that this is caused by the obstetricians not washing their hands between delivering babies. Oh, wow. And I think they're carrying bacteria from one woman to the next and infecting that next woman. And back, this was back in the days when they, you know, their, their gowns were soaked with blood, which was, you know, high praise. And he was ridiculed and he was you know said this is quackery and he was ridiculed to the point 
that he actually committed suicide because he was so, you know, ridiculed and ostracized. Uh, come to find out a few years later, Joseph Lister found out that, in fact, antiseptics used in gynecology, used in obstetrician, <laughs> solved the problem. And Samuel Weiss was correct, but he was the first one through the wall. Mm -hmm. And they ridiculed him to the point that he committed suicide. Yeah. So it's really, anyhow. really hard. It's hard. But you and others are are leading the pack. So I want you to explain to people what we need to know about the gut because we know there's a lot of bacteria, we know there's good and bad, we know antibiotics at this point will take the good and the bad, so you probably have to supplement when you're on antibiotics if you're doing that, but explain kind of the, the gut and how we need to look at it and the do's and don'ts. I know that you have the gut check eating cycle, you have the gut check food plan, all of that. Let's get into kind of the nitty gritty of your microbiome so that we can figure out how to avoid disease or reverse disease. Yeah. The, uh, the, the good news is that almost everything that's going to happen to us, uh, good or bad, is uh, controlled by the microbiome, number one, and also by the integrity of the wall of our gut. And it's those two combinations. There's another way of doesn't the wall of the gut change every 24 hours? Yes and no. So the wall of the gut, the, the gut has the same surface area as a tennis court, literally. And wow. That ten, yeah. How? Literally. It's Inside of us. A, a tennis court. Some people argue it's two tennis courts, but I won't quibble. Um, but it's huge. The problem with our design is the wall of our gut is only one cell thick one cell thick and those cells you're correct those cells have a very quick turnover the way the gut is designed is i'm old enough to remember a game called red rover red rover yep. and red rover yeah. red rover send steven right That's, over exactly uh, it's not allowed in schools anymore because it's much too dangerous. This is true. Okay. <laughs> is that hilarious? <laughs> so we all had we all had arms crossed, right? And the big kid came running over and tried to get through the wall. So our cells are bound together, crossed arms, with what are called tight junctions. And uh, there won't be a test, folks, so don't worry about it. Hmm. So we know now that gluten and other lectins, and lectins are proteins that are plant defense proteins, want to get to the wall of the gut. If they get to the wall of the gut, they produce a compound called zonulin. Zonulin breaks the wall, these tight junctions, and now you have a gap. And that gap is leaky gut, intestinal permeability. Now, the interesting thing is, this obviously happened a lot because on the other side of this single cell layer, 80% of our white blood cells, 80% of our immune system is sitting right there. Those are our warriors oh. ready to fight. Exactly. That's because mischief is going to come through and they have to be ready. All right, friends, hope you enjoyed that. Tomorrow, we are talking all about how to work with our gut. We're talking prebiotics, postbiotics, probiotics, all the biotics. We're talking fermented food and how to know if your gut microbiome is working, even without a blood test. We'll get to all of that tomorrow. In the meantime, be nice people, make good choices, and be present. This podcast and all related content published or distributed by or on behalf of Maria Menunos or mariamenunos.com is for informational purposes only and may include information that is general in nature and that is not specific to you. Any information or opinions expressed or contained herein are not intended to serve as or replace medical advice, nor to diagnose, prescribe, or treat any disease, condition, illness, or injury, and you should consult the healthcare professional of your choice regarding all matters concerning your health, including before beginning any exercise, weight loss, or healthcare program.
program. If you have or suspect you may have a healthcare emergency, please contact a qualified healthcare professional for treatment. Any information or opinions provided by a guest expert or host featured within website or on company's podcast are their own, not those of Maria Menounos or the company. Accordingly, Maria Menounos and the company cannot be responsible for any results or consequences or actions you may take based on information or opinions.